Good evening, all. Myself, Matthews Jivadat. I'll be the moderator for today's session. World Side Day was organized by Lions Club International Foundation. It was created as a campaign to help people understand the importance of supporting people's ability to see and to keep their sights protected. The day specially concentrates on understanding what can be done to help those who are blind or hard of sight. By following the footsteps and goodwill of the founding organizers of World Side Day, we Little Flower Hospital and Research Center and Little Flower Institute of Medical Science and Research Angamali, Kerala, India presents to you a topic, Refractive Blindness, a Global Perspective. Let me begin with thanking Kerala Society of Ophthalmic Surgeons for providing, uh, providing us their uh, Zoom platform to host the event. Let, let us start with a silent prayer. Thank you all. Let's welcome the head of the Department of Ophthalmology, Dr. Elizabeth Joseph, Little Flower Hospital, Angamali, to deliver the welcome speech. Welcome you, ma'am. Greetings to everyone. Am I audible? Yes. Yes. See, Little Flower Hospital and Research Center Angamali and LIMSA jointly is conducting this web stream to give a message in this occasion. Next, our director, Father Vargis Portagel, is the source of inspiration for all of us. Under his able leadership, LF Hospital could achieve newer heights, including NABH reaccreditation in spite of the COVID restrictions. He has many projects and programs for the improvement of this hospital. I welcome other director, Father, Father Vargis Potekel, to this webinar. I'm actually very much indebted to Padma Shri, Shri uh, Dr. Tony Fernandez, whom we call lovingly as Tony Sir. He is the doyen of ophthalmology, not only in Kerala, but also all over India. He was the national president of the Ophthalmological Society. What Little Flower Hospital today is because of his vision and hard, hard work. He has trained hundreds of ophthalmologists and optometrists. 
and i am lucky to be one among them sir please accept our warm welcome to this webinar father varghese palati is the assistant uh, director of lf hospital and he is in charge of the ophthalmic department of little flower hospital and he is taking extra effort to make the ophthalmic department function all the more better than previous days we we, we are very thankful to your leadership uh, father and we welcome you to this meeting and uh, <laughs> Dr. Sheshad De Nairo is handling the scientific session today. He is a world-renowned teacher and has many publications to his credit. He is at present the Reader School of Health Sciences, Aston University, UK. I welcome Dr. Sheshad De Nairo to this webinar and look forward to a very enlightening talk. Now I would like to welcome Professor Sarah Matthew, Principal of Limsar. She is the guiding force to the whole lot of students. Welcome, Madam. At this moment, I would like to welcome all the delegates and all the participants to this webinar. We are looking forward to a very high, a very high intellectual activity during the rest of the time. Once again, I would like to welcome all the faculty members. all the delegates and all the administrators to this program thank you very much thank you madam <coughs> today our guest of honor is dr babu krishna kumar who is the honorable president of kerala society of ophthalmic surgeons I welcome doctor to address the audience. Welcome sir. Respected Dr Tony sir, Reverend Father Dr Burgess Patakel, Dr Elizabeth Joseph, Dr Shahzad A Nehru, Professor Sara Matthew and dear friends. It is an honor to be invited to be a function by LF Hospital Angamali and gratifying most is sharing the stage with legendary Tony sir. Thank you Dr Elizabeth for inviting me to this meeting. Kaiser is happy to be associated with observing World Sight Day with Little Flower Hospital and Limsar Angamali. Second Thursday of October uh, of every year is being contribute much to the world. We can be a helping hand to many people who suffer and let this day be an occasion to make that effort and to make that pledge that we can be of use to uh, many many people who are in need and especially our ophthalmology section i am thankful to them for their service for their cooperation and for their ministry to the society and this day marks a special day as we are committed to service and with these words of appreciation and also pledge that we can work more i can good my words thank you very much Excuse me, doctor. Can you unmute your mic? Your mic. Thank you. Hope you you can hear me. Yes. Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes per perfectly okay. The president of the Kerala Society of Ophthalmic Surgeons, Dr. Babu Krishna Kumar, the director of the Little Flower Hospital, Dr. Vargis Potakar. director assistant director father vergis palati the invited speaker okay yeah nindu sorry for the interruption okay 
the invited speaker dr shishad naru my long time colleague and famous pediatric ophthalmologist of india dr elizabeth joseph my old colleagues the young and un- upcoming ophthalmologist optometrist and teachers of the school principal of limsa professor sara matthew and friends i deem this as a privilege that you have extended to me to address and inaugurate the seminar on the world side day especially in an institute that I had the privilege to play my humble role in its development thank you all for the good words expressed god has used me as an instrument in his hand and whatever i have achieved or we have achieved i offer the glory of god as you all mentioned and our president has explained about today's function this awareness day was coordinated by the international agency of prevention of blindness iap and as he said as our president said the beautiful message is love your eyes he has also mentioned that about a billion people suffer from refractories or other eye problems leading to blindness we had in india many years ago this my experience of 57 years in of the world when i came to angamadi i found the greatest problem of blindness was cataract this insurmountable problem due to cataract was so prevalent that we had to do a lot of eye camps with the help of the national program for control of blindness and with the private private agency all over the world we could control this blindness to a great extent now the the fight is not over we have to prevent blindness especially among the children i am happy that dr shishad naru is talking on an important issue on refractory errors when for about 40 years ago when we were concentrating on cataract i found a lot of children coming to the outpatient from the schools and they were not the ch- the parents were not aware that the children was having refractions they were not doing good in their ex- examinations so we started in a small way training the teachers from each school how to diagnose visual defect and the people who were found to have the visual defect were collected and we did a camp and a lot of people all of children were saved from going blind many squint amblyopia would be saved us as well my suggestion to the ksos is that 
we have to take up the preventive aspect of blindness, especially among the children. Every school child must be examined compulsively and that they must be given a card, a health card, where the, the vision is also recorded. We have sufficient doctors and optometrists. With the help of the government, this project can be implemented. But of course, one has to convince the politicians. This is a very important thing because as from the experience that we had in the COVID, we know that when the doctor suggests something, it may not be followed by them. They always depend on the administrators. So ophthalmology societies have to come forward and convince these people. I quote the famous saying of Helen Keller, the only thing worse than being blind is having sight but no vision. And as you all know, very few politicians suffer from this. I take this occasion to thank you all for inviting me to this meeting and giving me an occasion to inaugurate this function. With all your blessings, I officially declare this webinar as inaugurated. Thank you very much for the patient here. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me clearly. Great. That's great. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be here on World Sight Day, uh, especially amongst such uh, distinguished companies. So uh, from myself as well, welcome to uh, the distinguished guests and welcome uh, also to uh, Dr. Fernandez. Uh, and it's very interesting to hear about your history of long work. Uh, Dr. Babu uh, Krishna Kumar, uh, thank you for this opportunity. Dr. Elizabeth Joseph, thank you very much. And uh, uh, Father Vargese for your kind words at the beginning. Professor Sarah Matthews, and of course, Dr. Matthews uh, Vadaf, who uh, arranged the invitation and emailed me with the contact details for today's uh, webinar. So thank you very much to everybody and also distinguished guests and friends and colleagues. Um, it is World Sight Day, and it's a very important day. Um, it's, my, my last visit to India was about four years ago, actually, and I hope on my next visit I can come to Kerala. I, I heard so many great things about Kerala and um, the south of India and this this part especially, and uh, the welcomingness of the of the people there, especially I hear about the big hearts of the people of Kerala. So I, I would love to come and visit and see that for myself. Um, I'm going to move over to my slides. So can I uh, uh, do a share screen? Is this possible? Yeah, it is possible. Okay. So I'm going to share my slides. And I think hopefully you can see my first slide. Okay. So the first slide is the uh, the title slide. And um, we've already had the introduction to the topic, which is going to be about refractive blindness. And you know what what is the importance of of tackling refractive blindness blindness and dr fernandez was talking about his work when he first moved to the region and he was tackling cataract 57 years ago 
But of course, there were many patients with refractive error issues as well, which uh, needs to be tackled alongside the cataract problem. So let me just first of all start by telling you who I am. Um, I'm a reader in Aston University uh, in the College of Health and Life Sciences. And uh, my other roles are within the profession, the editor of the Contact Lens and Anterior Eye Journal. Uh, This is one of the um, top 25% ophthalmic journals in the world and uh, listed on PubMed and uh, Science Direct and um, uh, Medline, etc. cetera. Uh, this year, I stepped down as the president of International Association of Contact Lens Educated after 10 years. And, um, but I, I remain to be a visiting professor in Saudi Arabia and also in Lebanon. And I'm also an advisor to hospitals in India and Pakistan. And I also have some work with um, uh, quite an important eye hospital group in uh, Israel, uh, based in Jerusalem. And uh, this is the St. John of Jerusalem Eye Hospital Group. And they're a very interesting group because they date back uh, nearly 1,000 years. And um, the original site of their first hospital in Jerusalem is still used today as an eye hospital. And uh, the history of eye care globally is, is such a fantastic legacy. And we have to continue that, you know, so I'm, I'm proud to be involved in that group as well. I think you will know many of these key facts. And of course, depending on which organization, which literature, which report you read, you'll have different figures. But we, we think that at the moment, around a quarter of a billion people are living with vision impairment. This is people who haven't had their vision impairment corrected. And 36 million people around the world are blind. And the majority of those people who have those vision problems uh, will have moderate to severe vision impairment. And this is a problem which can affect those older patients a little bit more, the patients who are above the age of 50. And also studies have shown that it actually affects females more than uh, male patients. And there are some gender discriminatory issues related to this. And in some parts of the world, It might be felt that it's more important to make sure that the male members of the family have the vision correction so that they can go to work. But this isn't actually always so productive because the females in the family will have a very important role. And it's very important to not ignore female blindness. Globally, of course, those chronic eye diseases are the main causes of vision loss. But, and this this is the big issue in my mind. Uncorrected refractive error and unoperated cataract are the two biggest causes of vision impairment. I'm going to say that again. Uncorrected refractive error and unoperated cataract. Now, whenever I hear that, whenever I read that, whenever I um, see that in a journal, see it in a presentation, I, I get embarrassed by that fact. Why? Because we are eye care practitioners. Globally, cataract is one of the most common surgical procedures in the whole world. And it's certainly the most common eye procedure, or ophthalmic procedure in the whole world. But why have we got so many people who are having visual impairment because of cataract? And what about uncorrected refractive error? What does that mean? That basically means the need for glasses. There are millions of patients around the world who might be classed as low vision or blind simply because they have no access to refractive error correction. They have no access to spectacles. This, of course, is a bigger problem in those lower and middle income countries. And usually those countries have the less well-established healthcare systems. So we're not talking about poor countries necessarily. We're talking about countries where the healthcare system is less established for whatever reason. And that can be to do with the wealth of the country. There are other infectious eye diseases which uh, are hygiene related or um, infection related, which may be something else. And those we can tackle as we're going along, of course. But 80% of those vision impairment patients can be prevented or cured. So prevention, how do we manage this? Education. Cure, 
how do we manage this? This is our services to the patient based around us. This is one of the definitions of a low vision or blindness. This is from the World Health Organization from 2006. And uh, in their action plan, they reported this. Low vision was reported as being visual acuity of less than 618, but equal to or better than 360. Uh, field loss of less than 20 degrees in the better eye. And it says here, with the best possible correction. And similarly with blindness, there was a caveat saying that this is the definition of blindness with the best possible correction. Now, there was a revision of this because this was criticized at the time in 2006. And the revision was saying, actually, we shouldn't say with the best possible refractive correction. We should say in their presenting correction, because many of these people, although they can have spectacles or contact lenses uh, or devices which Im improve their vision, if they don't have access to it, then you have to measure them as they present to you because that's the best that they can achieve. They can't achieve anything better because they don't have access to those spectacles that they need. Now, there's two graphs here. Uh, the first graph on, um, the, the, uh, uh, on your left as you're looking at this slide, which is telling you all of the causes of blindness, um, excluding refractive error. And you can see that in almost half, 47% is related to cataract. Now, there are some of these which we can't really do much about. So we're looking at those age-related mac age, uh, macular degeneration patients. That's about 9%. The glaucoma patients, we can manage some of them. We can do some surgery and some drops maybe. But in many cases, it may uh, be slowly creeping up this blindness, and it's about 12%. But the cataract ones, we can certainly do something about. That's nearly half of those blind patients. Now, if we include refractive error, the figures become even more embarrassing because nearly one in five patients around the world are blind because of the need for refractive error correction. That's nearly 20%, 18% of patients are blind because they need to have glasses. And that's where I get very sad by this because you know, we need to manage that much better than this. We need to make sure that the services are available to every village, to every child, to every adult, to every female patient everywhere in the world. Now, let's just do a little bit of a, a, a look at the International Council of Ophthalmology. Now, on the International Council of Ophthalmology, they suggest that around 300 million people have visual impairment, and they say it's around um, two-thirds are cataract and refractive errors. So slightly different figures, but in the same sort of ballpark. And if you go onto their webpage, you can look at this list yourself and you can look at every single country and you can look at to see which country um, the population is of that country and how many ophthalmologists per million of population. And then what percentage of those ophthalmologists are conducting surgery? So in some countries, for example, in this chart, you can see Poland, for example, only 8% of the ophthalmologists are performing surgery. Whereas somewhere like Egypt, 90% of ophthalmologists perform surgery. So there's a big dis uh, um, discrepancy across the world, a, a big range of services offered by ophthalmologists. Now, globally, the average is around 60%. That basically means globally, around 60% of ophthalmologists are offering surgery. That means 40% are not offering surgery. So what is that 40% doing? They are doing mainly medical ophthalmology and mainly the care of refractive errors. So they are, are working like medical uh, sort of doctors um, and optometrists, but they're not performing eye surgery. Now we've already said that cataract is the one of the biggest causes of blindness in the world. So wouldn't it be great if these surgeons who are trained to a very good level globally could actually be harnessed and utilized better for managing the cataract problem globally, because that would mean that that cataract issue would get sorted. But then who would do the job of the, the optometry, the refraction element? Well, this is maybe where the optometrists can come in and there's what we call mid-level personnel. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a second as well and why that is a possible solution. 
Now, this is a, a, a picture I saw in, um, I was in a conference, the World Council of Optometry Conference to, um, three years ago in um, Morocco. And there was a picture there in a shop of what is the job of an optician. And you can see the optician's job is to look at the patient's eye through this, I don't know what this black tube is, but it must be some sort of primitive ophthalmoscope. And then there was another picture nearby, which was the role of the ophthalmologist. What's the job of the ophthalmologist? Well, if you look, the pictures are very, very similar. Maybe the ophthalmologist, he has to bend over a little bit more. Maybe the patient has to bend down a little bit more uh, to see the ophthalmologist. Um, but you can see that the roles are overlapping. Now, what is an optometrist? Well, an optometrist is somewhere in between that because um, globally, most opticians will be the people who are dispensing and providing the spectacles. But the optometrist is the person who is doing the eye examination to check. And the ophthalmologist is the person, generally speaking, who is doing the surgery and the medical management of the eye diseases. So there is an overlap. And that's something which we have to be sensitive of because in some parts of the world, um, people are worried about their own practice and they're worried that somebody else will take over their business, essentially. So let's look at the definition of optometry. And uh, you know, optometry is a healthcare profession. And the, the, I've underlined the key words. It's autonomous. What does that mean? It means that they work independently. They don't work under supervision. This is not like ophthalmic nurses who work under supervision of ophthalmic doctors. They're educated. They're not people who are just trained by their parents and they work in the, the family business. These are educated people. And this is a regulated profession. And these are primary healthcare practitioners. And the, the roles include refraction, dispensing, detection, and in some cases, treatment of minor eye conditions as well. The regulated part is also quite important here. Now, in India, I know that the Optometry Council of India is starting to regulate uh, optometry in the, uh, in, in the nation and doing a great job there as well. And the Lakshmi Shinde and other people have worked very hard in, in that area, which is great because this protects the profession and protects the patients because the patients can feel satisfied that who they're seeing is not a quack. They're seeing somebody who is trained and regulated and is able to undertake that job, that task. So when we talk about the services that are required around the world, well, there's definitely a screening element. You need to find how many patients have the problem. And the picture that you can see with the, the old man sitting on the bed, this was actually a study in, in the, the northern parts of India, uh, in the Punjab area of India, where um, the doctors went from door to door in the wrong direction in a village just to see how many people had eye problems in this village. And they were doing a screening service and they used this to interpolate um, what the percentage of eye problems were in a rural community. There's also a diagnostic service. And um, so once you've identified the problem, what are you going to do with it? You've identified there's a problem, but we need to know what the problem is. So this is the diagnosis element. And that might be, like Dr. Fernandez was saying, that um, you can do a screening service of school children, for example. And then you make sure that those school children with the problem see the, the qualified person so that the diagnosis can be correct. And in terms of refractive blindness, there needs to be a dispensing service as well. You need to provide the device. You need to provide the spectacles. Now, there's two pictures here of the young boy. He's wearing, uh, using these LED telescopes. And this was a young boy who um, was basically classed as blind by his family, but with simple, cheap, almost toy-like binoculars, he was able to use those as a telescope device and able to attend normal school. He was able to attend regular school and have a regular education. And he's using a stand magnifier in one picture and he's using the binocular telescopes in the other picture. Just some simple management in his case, some simple dispensing of the product was able to um, get him back to school and give him an education. And in fact, the story is a little bit further than that because in this case, he's using this magnifier, the stand magnifier the hospital started to manufacture them because 
they found that actually you can manufacture these quite simply, just plastic tubes, and they actually use drain pipes, you know, old discarded drain pipes. They clean those up and they put a lens inside and made a stand so that light could enter from the side as well. And then there has to be a treatment service as well. Now, the little old lady in the corner here, she was identified in this first study in, in Punjab where um, she had cataract. And when we, the people asked her, you know, had a cataract, she said she had them for many years. The family had ignored the fact that she couldn't see, but she felt her own self-worth to be quite low. Her self-esteem was quite low. Her quality of life was very poor. She couldn't see the food on her plate to eat her dinner. She certainly couldn't do any cooking or do any housework. And, um, you know, by making sure that she had cataract surgery done, she was able to contribute to the family again. And suddenly she felt alive again. Suddenly she felt she was an important member of the family. So don't ignore the psychological effects that blindness and poor vision has to, to patients. Now, I always say that people don't know what they don't know. And here's some pictures that I took in Pakistan and, and also in, in Hyderabad when I was there last time. And, um, you know, we, we know that if people don't eat, if, they, if there's a drought, if people are, are hungry, they will die. So we know this. This is kind of known to us now. But we also know that when people are sitting on a, on a mo motorcycle and there's five people on a moped uh, or a bicycle or something like this, then that's potentially a problem, a hazard. And we hear, you know, all the time we read in the newspapers that a, a motorcycle accident happened where five people, a whole family were sitting on a motorcycle and nobody was wearing a, a helmet. But people don't know what they don't know. So we need to educate them. We need to tell them, actually, that's not a good idea to do that because this can happen. You know, and uh, if something happens, you know, the, 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 ch the small child is often at the front. They're the first one who's going to be hit and they're going to get the most severe injury and they're not going to have a helmet on. So we need to advise patients. Now, of course, this is going a little bit beyond optometry. Now, this is just pr general primary health care. But patients need to be aware that when they're doing these type of road activities, they should wear helmets. Now, the bottom scene here, you can see the, the man smoking and you can see another man. He's working on the, the pavement. He's, he's um, repairing the pavement. He's repairing the sidewalk. And he's using a hammer and he's, he's, he's bashing the, the stones. And small bits of stones are flying up all the time when he's doing this. He doesn't know that's dangerous. We know it's dangerous because we are trained eye care practitioners. We are trained ophthalmic practitioners. We are ophthalmologists and we're optometrists, opticians and whatever else profession we have. So we know this is dangerous. So we have this information and he doesn't have it. We need to make sure that he has that information. How can we do that? Maybe we need to run safety campaigns. We need to put posters up. We need to put leaflets in newspapers, um, advise school children so they can tell their parents, et cetera, et cetera. But if this man is working on the stones and the stone hits him in the eye, there could be a traumatic cataract. There could be a traumatic corneal blindness. There could be all sorts of things that happen because he doesn't know that that's a problem. You know, for so the education and the awareness element is something we shouldn't ignore as ophthalmic practitioners. We need to get the messages out there. We need to prevent as well as cure these problems. And just some examples here. This is uh, an eye hospital that I was working with in, in Pakistan. This is about 10 years ago uh, in Royal Pindi, <clears throat> the Al Shifa Eye Trust. And we were looking at their training program and trying to improve the quality of their training program. And the bottom picture is, uh, I, I'm not in this picture. I, I actually took this picture. But this is a, 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 a bunch of students and practitioners in uh, Palestine. And they were doing an eye camp in a Bedouin Camp. And this Bedouin camp was basically a, um, a, couple, a few families living together in really in, in a camp, you know, with no electricity. They were just living from the land. And um, but to make sure that they had some sort of screening service so that any potential problems in the vision of, the, of that unit living in that family in the Bedouin camp could be identified and treated. This is one of my uh, favorite um, places that I visited. This is about four years ago. I visited Bihar, the Akanjoti Eye Hospital in Mastichak. And um, it's a very interesting hospital because in that area, uh, it's a very, very poor area. Um, and what they do is they train 
female students from a young age and give them a full education and then train them to be optometrists and they work in the eye hospital. So there's m- multiple things going on here. They want to make sure that the girls get an education. They want to give the girls optometry education so that they can have a job as well. And then by giving them optometry education, they can provide an ophthalmic service in the region. And now this is the uh, one of the biggest eye hospitals in, in Eastern India. And uh, they do you know, hundreds of cataract surgeries per day. So it's a very interesting hospital. Um, but they are empowering that female generation, that young female generation who, who really need a voice to need to be stronger in the future as well. And now they are uh, really a great success example in what they can achieve. <clears throat> so let's think about the, the steps in the provision of a refraction service. So when we're talking about refractive blindness, we want to implement a refraction service. So we said we need some sort of case detection. We need to identify those individuals with the vision that can be corrected with the the spectacles or whatever device we're going to use. So we need an eye examination because we also want to see if there are any other coexisting eye conditions. Is the reason for their poor refraction something else? Or is there something else happening at the same time? So it's not enough just to make a refraction. We need to do uh, some sort of basic eye examination as well. That will include the refraction, that will include the dispensing of the device, and that will include a follow-up as well. Because with some spectacles are pretty straightforward. We put them on, the patient can see. If they can't see, they will tell you. But sometimes the patient may have low vision and you need to train them in something like eccentric viewing, or you want to train them how to use a telescope or a magnifier. If you have a low vision patient with a macular degeneration and you give them a magnifier, they hold it, they say, I can't see. But you need to train them. So the follow-up visit is also very important. What if the screws fall out of the spectacles? How are they going to get those repaired? So the follow-up service is important as well. So how do we detect these cases. Now, again, Dr. Fernandez mentioned this in his, in his introduction that um, you know one of the ways is you could train people to do basic identification of eye problems. Now, in this picture, this is a colleague of mine, and what he's doing is he's training lady health workers who are going to the villages, and they, they're talking to female patients about lady health issues, but he's training them to identify eye problems. So he's saying, when you go there, you can also do these other tasks and see if you can identify any eye problems, and then you can send them to the eye hospital, and we will send the minibus uh, to collect those um, those patients. Now, there's up and downsides to that type of approach, and I'll, I'll mention that again in a second. Because one of the problems is that when you train people to be screeners, you don't give them an autonomous career. They're, they're dependent on something. They don't have an independent mindset and an independent skill set. And many, many times, those, pay, those practitioners who do that role, they want to upskill. And I, and I have seen projects around the world where uh, they train the nurses to be the screeners. But then those nurses actually think, actually, I enjoy this ophthalmic side of my day more than the other side of my day. And I want to upskill. So the training we give to people should be of international standards. One of the problems is we have a lack of teachers, we have a lack of training institutes, and we certainly have a lack of teachers and training institutes in the rural areas. There's also a public perception of allied health professions because they will say, well, he's not a doctor, so why is he telling me advice? So again, this comes down to education of the, of the patients, of the public to say, well, actually, there is this mid-level profession or what we call allied health profession, which can help the eye doctors because they can identify the eye problems and any serious eye problems can then be referred to have eye surgery or uh, medication, et cetera. And this is where the the World Council of Optometry has this quite nice uh, sort of uh, well, it started as, as four stages. Um, it's grown now. It's now actually six stages. But essentially, they say, well, if we divide primary eye care into these four basic levels, we have technical services. And this could be the basic dispensing and screening level. And then we have the vision function services. The, the basic level goes one step further 
and they can measure the refractive error. And then we have the optometry level, level three. Uh, in, in most countries, that would include the use of diagnostic drugs. In some countries, that's restricted a little bit. And then we have the therapeutic services. So the minor condition treatments, so they can give drops for eye infections or something like this. Now, in some parts of the world, um, that training will also include minor eye surgery. And certainly there are um, op optometrists in China who are trained to do the basic eye surgery in, for, for some things. And in, in USA, there are some states where optometrists are trained to do certain types of laser procedure, for example. So it, it depends on the country, depends on the needs. So you, you kind of need to look at your own region and what is required in your area, first of all. Now, in the UK, we have something called the General Optical Council. And in 1958, this became law. And the law is that if you want to work as an optometrist or an optician in the United Kingdom, you must register with the General Optical Council. And this piece of law created the General Optical Council. Now, the law was updated in 1989, so the picture is of the 1989 Act, uh, but it was based on the original 1958 Act. And that was the first time in UK law that optometry and opticianry was regulated. So if you go to a hospital or a high street or a market anywhere, and somebody says on their, sh on their shop window, it says optometrist. They cannot say that unless they're registered with the General Optical Council. They cannot say that they're an optician unless they're registered with the General Optical Council. So this is the importance of regulation because regulation protects the public. Regulation means that the patient, the public, will feel confident that when somebody is saying, I'm an optometrist, they actually are an optometrist. In the same way, if somebody says, I'm a doctor, I'm a medical doctor, you trust that they're a medical doctor. In the same way that doctors in the United Kingdom must register with the General Medical Council. And that includes ophthalmologists. They register with the General Medical Council. In the UK, we have a whole range of, um, sorry, in Europe, I should say, we have a whole range of uh, levels of optometry. And uh, we often say that in the UK, we have the highest level of optometry in, in Europe. But in some parts of Europe, there are less optometrists. You know, for example, in, in France, we have a lot less uh, you know, optometrists than we have uh, in the United Kingdom because they have a lot more ophthalmologists. So there's a lot more people trained doing medical ophthalmology in France than there are doing surgical ophthalmology. So those, patients, those practitioners are doing the refraction tasks. So when we're trying to develop these services around the world, these refraction services, the key element is you want to make sure the patients are being seen and being seen with the highest quality services. And how do you do that is the training, improving the training. Uh, and one of the things that I've done over the years is, is discuss this with faculty uh, to make sure that the faculty understand what the best level of care is, what is best practice guidelines. Um, and sometimes I've given lectures to students around the world, but try, trying to bring that level of education to an international standard. What we're not trying to do is to sort of go to a country and, and, and let's say somewhere like Nepal and say, well, in America, they do this, so you must do it the same way. No, that doesn't work because America isn't Nepal. Nepal isn't America. So in Nepal, the problems are very different to the USA. So you need to look at what's available first. And this is where you know, donations will help, financial donations, of course, but equipment donations as well. Equipment donations, you can see in the bottom picture there, this is uh, myself and a colleague, we were donating a FACO machine, which was donated by Bausch & Lomb to one of the hospitals that we were working with. So let me just think of a few questions here. Do we need optometrists? Well, kind of yes or no. We need ophthalmologists because they do the whole task. They do the whole surgery. They can do the refraction. However, ophthalmologists are expensive to train and they take a long time to train. You know, basic medical degree, five, six years, a couple of years of ophthalmology, maybe at least four or five years. So we're talking at least 10 years before somebody becomes an ophthalmologist. Whereas optometrists are much quicker to train and that means they're much cheaper to train. 
Well, what about opticians with refraction skills? Should they be sufficient? Well, again, yes and no. It depends again on the on the countries. In France, that seems to work well, but those opticians don't have the full eye examination capability, and those opticians are working as primary eye care, so they will miss some of the more serious problems because they haven't got the skill to look for those other problems. What about nurses with screening skills? I kind of said this already, but this is really.、Um, Often doesn't work because those nurses will feel that they have a, a barrier to their career. They can't progress beyond that screening level. They want to do more. They want to do the treatment and they want to do the diagnosis. They want to do the management, but they're not autonomous. Well, do all optometrists need to be trained the same? Well, again, we've said this already. Optometrists in the USA need to be trained for their needs. Optometrists in Nepal or China or Sri Lanka need to be trained for their needs. And does the training need to be full time? Well, it can be combined with a hospital, so these people can come in at the age of eighteen, nineteen, do the training, and also work in the hospital. And they can have some practical training from working in the hospital, and have some education from the the local universities. And what about local needs? You must identify what are the needs in the region. What are the healthcare professions in the region already that you can work alongside? And this is something that I presented at a, a meeting a couple of years ago when I was last in India, where I said, "Well, you can almost think of this as three years of study." And you can sort of say, "Well, if we have one year of study, you can have people who have a basic certificate in technology and screening, and they can work as assistants. And then the second year of study, these pa- these practitioners can work in a service called vision function service. Then the third level is the optometry level, the ocular diagnostic, and then maybe there's a specialist." Fourth year level as well, where there's a four level of, of training, and this fits quite nicely with the World Council of Optometry's、um, slide that I had before the yellow slide. Well, I said already that there is a, a lack of training institutions. There's also a lack of g- good teachers around the world. So, what about blended learning? This is how we can manage this problem because you know the, certainly the pandemic. One of the good things that's come out of the pandemic is all the webinars that we're now attending. We can now access experts in any field via a webinar, because you know, from from their home they can talk to us and tell us and educate us,、uh, regardless of where we're based in the world. So, what if these global experts were able to provide the core curriculum of lectures, and the lectures were available through the universities around the world through the training centres, and that was supported with practical training locally. With local hospitals, local eye centres, local practices, etc., local clinicians, and there was training support by the local clinicians who were doing the job daily, and they can say, actually, this is how you can do the job practically. Let me show you the practical skills you've learnt, the lecture skills you you have the didactic knowledge, but now let me show you in practice how it works. I'm a big fan of Bruce Springsteen. This is an American singer, and he has a song called "Cautious Man." And in this song called "Cautious Man," there's a line that says, "He would measure his need, and then very carefully he would proceed." So let's apply the Bruce Springsteen wisdom to ophthalmic training. What that means is, let's see what the problems are in our region. Let's count the need. Let's see, you know, in our region, is the problem cataract? Is it undiagnosed refractive error? Is it more pediatric? Is it more elderly? Let's think what the problems are, and then decide on what type of personnel you need. And you can sort of say, well, actually, we in our area there's five million people, lots of undiagnosed eye conditions. So we need lots of screeners. We need some diagnostic services. We need some treatment services. We need some specialist services. But the specialist services will be fewer. The screening services will be many. So you need more at the screening level and less at the top, and of course somebody could progress and train further to move up to a different level. And this could be global. You know, we could make our educational system for primary eye care quite global. And we can sort of say, look, in developing countries where there's less advanced healthcare, you need more screeners at level one. In the UK, most of our optometrists work at level three. Some at level four. But most at level three. That's the that's the com. In the USA, Australia, New Zealand, they work at more at level four. So again, you need to identify what's required in the country. And 
if the needs of the country change, if the needs of the population change, such as things like aging population, then people can be upskilled. They can sort of, we can say, actually, these level three people need the next level of training now. We need to get them back into training. And that can be a blended learning train. They don't have to go back to university full time. They can be blended learning. Or actually, the, the, the conditions change in this country. Those level three people have already the training for level two. So maybe they should work at level two for a while so that we can do more of that diagnostic element. And we can, we can map these roles onto existing programs. Um, now, the model doesn't include training for ophthalmology. Ophthalmology training is very different. Ophthalmologists learn medicine in a university, but then they don't stay in the university to learn ophthalmology. Where did they learn ophthalmology? They go to an ophthalmologist. They do a residency. They work with an ophthalmologist. They watch them, and the ophthalmologist teaches them how to do cataract surgery or whatever surgery they're, they're learning to do. So their training is different. So they don't fit into this type of training type of scheme. And, and medical degrees generally will be slightly different to this sort of primary care level. Now, I think one of the problems is in universities, you know, we have a three-year bachelor's degree in the UK. Most, well, there, there are some four, but most are three-year bachelor's degrees. And so what we've done is we've, we've taken every job and fitted it to a three-year training program. And for optometry, that doesn't really work because optometry probably needs more than three years. Then they might need four years of training. For nursing, three years might actually be too much in some cases. So and it depends on the, the job. So the universities need to make sure that we are training what's required and not just training because that's the way we did it for 100 years. So we need to make sure that the job fits what the community needs. And one size does not fit all because some countries will need four or five years training. Some people, some countries will need more people at the screening level. Um, but if individuals wanted to train further, then of course they can. They can re-enter the training program and go to the next level up. Uh, just to finish off, this is some of the information from um, the St. John Eye Hospital Group in Jerusalem, because one of the big issues that I wanted to highlight is that it's expensive. Now, if you look at here, this is the, the figures from the last uh, year, or, year, year or so. We don't have the 2021 20, data for these hospitals. Now, in, in this hospital group, there are six clinics. Uh, picture number five, this is the clinic I was telling you about, which is uh, nearly a thousand years old. And this is an outpatient clinic that's still used in uh, East Jerusalem, quite central area uh, of Jerusalem. And uh, it's quite close to the church where Christ is supposedly crucified and quite close to the, the Wailing Wall. It's a very interesting part of, um, part of the world and very imp interesting part of Jerusalem. But if you look at the numbers here, you can see these are not massive numbers of patients being operated on. There are quite a lot of patients being treated you know, and uh, quite a lot of staff. But look at the running costs. I mean, the main hospital costs more than eight million pounds, that's around $10 million a year to run. And you know, that's expensive. Th these are expensive hospitals to run. Now, I I've, I've been working with this hospital group for six, seven months now. And one of my suggestions to them is because they have a service which is heavily reliant on ophthalmologists who are expensive to train, expensive to employ, but maybe they need more mid-level personnel to help and supplement the ophthalmologists. This is the, the pyramid model that Professor Nagrao from Hyderabad and the LV Prasad Eye Institute talks about. And this is actually his slide from, um, from his webpage. And he talks about the pyramid model where he says, well, actually, LV Prasad in central in, in uh, um, Hyderabad is the center of excellence. You don't need in, in Hyderabad, you don't need 10 of those centers of excellence. You need one of those centers of excellence. And then you need these tertiary care centers. And if they can't manage the problem, they send it to the center of excellence. But if you look down to the bottom, he calls it vision guardians, where he says, you know, we have these vision guardians, patient, um, practitioners trained at a basic level to find and screen for the eye problems. They can send the patients to the vision centers where they may be able to get their spectacles. If they can't manage them and they need some supplementary services, they can send them to the optometrists in the service centers where they may get the low vision aids, they may get some basic antibiotics or whatever. If they can't manage it and they need something like cataract surgery, they can go to the tertiary center. If they need something like retinal surgery, 
they can go to the center of excellence. So there's this pyramid model. And that pyramid model works very nicely because you can see straight away, you don't need hundreds at the top, but you need hundreds and thousands at the bottom. So you need more people at the bottom level and less people at the top level. If you distribute your services in a clever effect and efficient way. That, that was my last slide. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, my email address is on the slide there as well. I'm happy to take any questions today. Uh, I'm also happy to um, receive your emails and comments if anybody wants to, to do that afterwards. So I'm going to hand back to the chair. My pleasure. Ma'am, would you please uh, unmute your mic? You're not audible. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. A warm good evening to all. Uh, I hope you all have enjoyed the session because it was a very informative session. Uh, and uh, so I was explaining about uh, like the refractive blindness and his uh, scope and what all the things that we need to take care of it. Uh, so as we celebrated the World Sight Day uh, with the theme, Love Your Eyes, it creating an awareness to the society. Today, Little Flower Hospital and Research Center uh, LIMSA jointly organized a webinar on refractive blindness, a global perspective. It gives me an immense pleasure to deliver the word of thanks for this event to all the dignitaries and who have joined here. First of all, I would like to thank our special guest, Dr. Babu Krishna, uh, who is the president of Kerala Society of Ophthalmic Surgeon, who honored this function with his inspirational thought. Uh, we thank you, sir on behalf of LF and Limsan. Now I would like to express our heartfelt thanks to Patmasri Dr. Tony Fernandez, the eminent personality for his word of encouragement. Thank you, sir, for your valuable time you have taken and spent with us. Thank you, sir. I also extend my thanks to our respected director, Reverend Father Dr. Vargis Potekel for inspiring us in working towards the goal of conducting the webinar. We are grateful to how Dr. Shahat A. Naro is a reader, School of Life and Health Science Aston, who despite his busy schedule has found time to share his valuable knowledge and information about refractive blindness. When he was going through his slides, he was talking about us we need to uh, understand about the blended learning and also the type of persons that we need to need to look into and estimate the number and we must have a plan of implement how we need to approach. Also, he was explaining about the global approach towards the thing. So, uh, we extremely extend our thankful to you, Sir Naro, uh, for spending this time uh, and giving a valuable information and talk with us. Thank you, doctor. No event can take shape without a hardworking leader. It was the dedication and enthusiasm of our leaders. Our assistant director, Reverend Father Vargis Palati, and Dr. Elizabeth Joseph, HOD Department of Ophthalmology, the backbone of this webinar, which made this event a huge success. We extend our heartfelt gratitude for them. Thank you, Father, and th thank you, Doctor. Our special thanks to Dr. Rajiv Sugumar, Sugumaran, Scientific Committee Chairman, who gave us this Zoom platform for making this program a big success. Thank you for the K KSOS, uh, Kerala Society of Ophthalmic Surgeon team uh, for giving this online platform and made this event a grand success. Next, I would like to thank all our delegates and the participants for accepting our invitation and join to this webinar for making this a grand success. Last but not least, all the LF Ophthalmic Department team members, the LIMSAR HOD and team, all the media, and for making this program 
a resounding success. Thank you once again, all my colleagues, my family members for making this program a grand success. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, now we've got around 15 minutes remaining on this session. If anyone got any doubts, they can directly ask. I think uh, Ms. Reena Durai got a question she texted uh, in the comments. Uh, you can ask, ma'am, now. Am I audible? Yes, yes, you are. Yes, yes, you are. Okay, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Anu Chato. She is the one who is uh, responsible for me to join this uh, wonderful session today. Uh, I would also thank uh, Dr. Shanad uh, so much for this extremely informative talk. I'm glad that I attended this session. I just had a quick question regarding the presentation that you had. You were saying that um, investing on an ophthalmologist is more of time consuming and, uh, you know, when you compare that to an optometrist or optician, it's more efficient. I was just wondering, uh, since we are in the era of technology, I am more intimidated uh, with the technology that is coming up than uh, the competition that's there or the comparison that's there between ophthalm, opton and optician. So what is your standpoint about having all these technologies that could do anything and everything, um, you know, detecting the refractive error, performing cataract surgeries, you no more need your retinoscope. So what's your standpoint about that? Dr. Rina, that's a great question. And um, I, I think firstly, we shouldn't be scared of technology. And, and the technology is designed to help us to conduct the service that we deliver. It's not designed to replace us. <laughs> it's designed to help us. So don't be, we shouldn't be scared of it. That's the first thing. And now, uh, and this is why I was saying that there is a difference between, you know, for example, if I wanted to implement an eye care service in, um, in, in West Africa, where the technology might be lacking. So in that area, I might need to rely more on screening personnel. Whereas if I'm going to implement a service in an urban area of India, then I can utilize the technology better. And that technology could be instrumentation such as auto refraction, such as um, uh, um, fundus cameras or OCT or anything like that. But this equipment is expensive, of course. So it, it might not be able to be rolled out everywhere. Now, there is another way of doing that, of course, and that's the telemedicine approach. So maybe we can have the, uh, the mid-level personnel, the optician or the optometrist, who goes to the rural camps, and they can take an image centrally and that's linking with the the tertiary centers the service centers where they can get the information directly and they can maybe implement something so you might need to have you know a few people working in that telemedicine so there's a there's a, many many different ways that we can use technology and it's a very exciting time because the technology is there let's utilize it let's embrace it let's not be scared of it but in some cases we may still have to rely on the human skill just because of the resources Thank you. Thank you so much. And I really appreciate this talk. It was great having you here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Reena, for asking the question. If anyone, any other person has any questions, please do ask. <coughs> I think there's not any questions, but I'm just going to make one more comment, which was really to related to um, the education of the public and the education of patients, because this is something which is really important. You know, 
when the coronavirus problem started, we were told to wear masks, you know, so there was a big campaign telling us to wear masks, washing our hands and wearing rubber gloves and these sorts of things. We didn't know that. We didn't know that that's what we had to do to prevent the spread of coronavirus. We didn't know that we should stay inside because we never had that in our lifetime before. So the governments, the local hospitals, the newspapers, they gave us this information in these campaigns. Now, in the same way, we need to get the information out there that patients can help to prevent eye injury. Now, you know, myself, when I've been to India, when I've been to Pakistan and countries like this in Middle East countries, you, we see a lot of people working um, in quite dangerous occupations like mechanics, for example, we're repairing a car, but they have very poor lighting around them. You know, the mechanic doesn't know that with lighting, the safety element improves, but we know that. And this is what I mean by we need to get that information to those patients because the amount of preventable trauma that we could prevent is, is amazing. You know, I, I was in one place where I met an old man. He had two sons. Both his sons were blind from a calcium carbonate mining injury. There was an explosion in a, in a mine and the calcium carbonate went into the eyes of both his sons and both were corneal blind because of this injury. And, you know, really it's not their fault because they didn't know that this type of calcium carbonate can cause this type of caustic reaction to the cornea. But we know that. So the optometrist in that area, they need to tell the patients, be careful. So in your area, if there's a factory or a, a, a mine where they do these dangerous jobs, you need to tell them. You know? So we need to get this information out there to prevent injuries. We need to talk about hygiene with our patients. We need to talk about um, nutrition and good diet because these can prevent eye problems in older age. So let's get this information out there. And this is why I mean, this is the role of the mid-level professionals. This is not the role of ophthalmologists. They have that training, that skill to do the surgery, but we have this knowledge and this skill to help that first contact with the patient. So let's undertake that responsibility. Sure. My pleasure. We hope to see you even more in another sessions. And once you are here in India, please do visit Kerala and our hospital. It will be a huge privilege for us. I look forward to it. This is as an invitation too. It's very kind. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for joining. And once again, thank you all for joining on this wonderful session. We are ending the session soon. Once again, thank you all.